Hello, radio. Hello, hello. Uh, 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 uh. Not hearing anything. Anybody? How about if I unmute? Okay, there it is. There we go. We can hear you now, Tim. Oh, that's great. Excellent. Wow, grainy video, but we hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of sitting in a dark room. Oh, uh, well, I don't know if it's that or uh, or whatever. Let's see here. Hey there, Mariush. How are you? Good. How about yourself? We're good. Uh, where are you? Are you here or are you up in New Hampshire somewhere? Um, somewhere out there in space by Art Bell. <laughs> Trying to dodge the reentry of the booster. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I couldn't resist. You kind of laid that one out for me there. How's it going? It's good. It's good. So, did you do anything with the um, uh, fox hunting uh, antenna and, and attenuator with your students? No, not yet. Because when we were ready to do it, COVID hit. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of took everybody out by surprise, yeah. Yeah, because we had a, a amateur radio club that was going, started to go strong, and, you know, we were studying for our technician license, and then, boom, yep, we're, we're going to be shut down for a week, then a week turned into two weeks, and then... It turned into a year, yeah. You know, and I was like, so like, um, so a lot of this momentum that was built up, uh, you know, kind of got wiped away so um they just started they just started letting kids stay after school for um academic support um on tuesdays and thursdays but you know they don't want anybody in the building um, um unless you're doing academic support there's no clubs no it's it's uh yeah it'll it'll take a while maybe <clears throat> if all things get completely back to normal yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting for that. I really am. And Marcel, I love your background there. What is it? Oh, Mount Hood. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> Mount Hood. To me. Yeah, I don't know about Mount Hood, but it's uh, outer space there with the, uh, the Yeah, galaxies. no, it's, uh, if I get out of the way, you can see Mount oh, Hood. Oh, Mount Hood. Okay, that's right. Well, yeah. then, is Bell somewhere in the background? I'm sorry? Is Art Bell somewhere in the background over there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, I found that a couple of years ago. I used it for uh, a presentation I was doing. I don't even remember what the circumstances were. And uh, I liked it so much I used it as uh, the, the, what do you call it, the the background on my uh, my computer. Cool. Yeah. So, I love space stuff. It's, uh... Yeah. It's we can, in fact, Faye, Faye we, we just came back from Virginia and Faye, uh, I think we, we we both woke up in the middle of the night the night before we were supposed to go home. And she looks out the window that was behind the bed and she's like, wow, look at all the stars. <laughs> you know, because there was so very little light where we were. Yeah. We were really out, out in the country. I mean, horse <clears throat> horse uh, farms and everything. And there were no there were no lights. And it was. It yeah, was it's beautiful. amazing. The darkest sky sight I've ever seen. We were in uh, Ireland, down on the uh, the Dublin Peninsula, not not the Dublin Peninsula, the, the uh, Dingle Peninsula in Kerry. This is oh, I think five years ago. Uh, we were staying with one of Anne's aunts, and we had taken her out for dinner. We came back. It was probably ten ten thirty at night, midsummer, and. The stars were just, there were so many of them. You could see the Milky Way so clearly. It was like you could reach up and touch them. It was, I've never seen a, a sky that dark here in the States. You'd probably have to go to Montana or something like that to, to get that kind of a effect. It was just gorgeous. There's a place in central western Pennsylvania that's a designated dark area. I, I believe yeah. it's Pennsylvania um, where... Uh, uh, you can go and and it's supposed to be you know like what you saw there yeah I, that's one of my other hobbies and amateur astronomy and uh i haven't had a chance to do a lot of it lately but love it love looking at the sky cool how's your dad doing uh 
day to day, you know, it's like for every day that he has a good day with rehab and the exercises for a day and a half, two days afterwards, it's he's in bed and in pain. And Uh, at 91, I don't know how much fight he's got left in him. You know, it is what it is. It's a tough age. I I did a little work for a customer today. She's 92. She lives alone. Um, Still sharp as a tack. Unbelievable. That's what makes this so difficult with my mom. I mean, when she was in the nursing home and, you know, she was uh, ill, uh, you know, she she had the uh, Alzheimer's and she had no clue of it. And with him, I mean, he's as sharp as a tack. He, He can, he knows everything, knows what's going on follows the news, follows politics, and uh, he knows he doesn't want to be where he is. So. Uh, well, I guess you can just do what you, what you do. It's, uh, That's all we can do. This word might display it, everybody go. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening, Jurgen. Hi, Jurgen, Chet, who Jürgen. else we have? I got John. Hello, everybody. Got Don. Him. And John's got a oh, real, yeah, Larry, real Charlie, water buffalo Ken. back there this time. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing you might see on me is a cat walking by. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, we were down in Virginia. It was, it was in the eighties every day, mid to high eighties, and one day hit ninety five. We were dying. Oh. It was so hot. Of course, that was the day we went out with our son and his girlfriend. We went to the zoo and we went down Monument Drive in, in Virginia where they tore down all the monuments because of their confederacies <laughs> and uh, uh, did some other stuff. And it was hot, 95, humid. It was, it was crazy. And then come back today, we got the heat on. We came back yesterday, we got the heat on. I got fleece on and long pants. <laughs> we were in short sleeves and today? shorts. <laughs> uh, it, it was just well, from one extreme to another, it seems. Yeah, and you you're had not the heat on there yet. Yeah, we were both chilled today. I've got I've got a heavy fleece on right now. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, a couple of days ago, we were schwitzing like crazy. It was so hot, and the air conditioning was on. Yep. Uh, hey, Marouche, it's nice to meet you. Um, you. We've got to connect at some point. I want to talk to you about possibly doing a joint venture with you guys especially your students. Uh, I'm into high altitude ballooning, uh, pico ballooning, and I want to do a, uh, I want to do another launch very soon, but I'd love to do one sometime late fall, early winter next year with a hope of getting around the world. And uh, I need some help. There'll be something I'd be interested in because, um, because our our next project was to do a, um, um, what we were talking about was to do a, uh, do a weather balloon launch. Yeah. Attach a camera to it to take a picture of the curvature of the Earth, and then track the payload and, and go and recover it. So, because that was kind of, that was kind of in the works as as the club was getting momentum. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely. Okay, we got to. Um, I'm good on QRZ AA1WH at ARRL.net is my uh, email. If you can drop me an email, I would love to uh, set this up. Um, does, does, does Gary have uh, your email, Gary Thomas? Gary does. Gary's a tough guy, though, because uh, he's a very busy guy. Oh, uh, okay. Because if you can, um, or, or if you can, after the meeting, if we can hook up, we'll, I'll, I'll grab your information. I'm not, I'm not too active on QRZ. Um, okay. You can send it via chat, Marcel. Send him, send him a yeah, yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Mm. Good idea. Because we do that all the time with my networking mm. group. Yeah, we've done one mm. launch. Uh, I don't even remember when it was. Do you? Uh, was it like early March or something? Uh, and had to be around there. Yeah. Yeah. And we made it. Uh, we got to. We actually got higher than I thought we were going to get. I think we got to like thirty-eight thousand feet, and uh, we hit a storm about 200 miles east of the southern coast of Delaware. Uh, We were up for four hours. We, I don't know how, I I never really tracked it out. It's gotta be a good 500 miles we went and uh, we got iced up and the balloon came down. 
But the next balloon I want to do should get us up to about 44,000, 45,000 feet above some of these storms. And if we do it in the winter time, you know, we won't be uh, dealing with the severe thunderstorms that we are now. So it'd be a really cool thing to do. I can't do the soldering and all. My I've got uh, the putrin's contracture in my hands. I've got cataracts. I mean, there's no way I can do the, the build the boards. Is that something your guys could do? Your kids could do? Yeah. Um, so this, once I get into the presentation, yeah, but there, that's something we can do because um, working at a trade school, um, there's a lot of resources that are definitely. Um, available to like these types of projects and we have a lot of capabilities because um as a local school we try to be cutting edge i think even our the electronics department has their own machine where they can make their own printed circuit boards oh wow yeah like we like we you know like the different shops they really try to be abreast of the you know technologies that the students are going to be uh exposed to so, so they try to update their equipment, um, you know, as regularly as possible. That'd be super. I just, um, I just sent you Marcel, oh. uh, Marius, I just sent you Marcel's email. I'm gonna write that down right now. Yeah. Somebody's typing away furiously. Hi, That's Gary. Me. Oh. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Gary. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Larry. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're writing down everything Mario says. <laughs> oh. oh, it's easy because it's being recorded. So, <laughs> <coughs> oh, uh, how's everybody How doing tonight? Good. How was the trip back, Larry? Oh, uh, it was good. It, it, you know, we, we plotted it on the way down. We went west uh we went east of dc via google maps directions and it was like riverdale road stop and go for 50 miles and it drove us both nuts yeah so we swore we were going to take a different path so instead of going uh, east of dc we hopped on 95 and went west of dc and it may have been 50 miles longer but for some ungodly reason it took us like an hour and a half longer total trip time or an hour longer um but the trip was great it was hot down there um we had a lot of rain during your trip i don't know did, if you experienced anything but... no we had zero rain we went down it was a beautiful oh. sunny day you know no no problem going down the days we were there was uh the lowest temperature during the day was 83 the highest was 95 and hot um my son and his girlfriend went swimming and their friends went swimming in the river and i have to think the water temperature was around 50 but you know they're in their their mid tw uh, 20s so uh, and they said it was a little bit chilly a but little they bit. were freezing <laughs> yeah we didn't see this part but he said and, and his girlfriend said it, the water was a little chilly but they went in um uh, friends and uh, i have to think you know once you get beyond about six inches that water was cold oh yeah <laughs> how fast well, you, you don't come feel it out. anymore <laughs> ann and i were down in myrtle beach it's got to be six years ago in late january i think we went actually down it was around the time of martin luther king day so what's that around the 15th of the month and, and yeah, we were walking january. on the beach it was a nice day it was probably in the low 50s and there's a family sitting you know right at the edge of the the water and they had two kids i don't know 12 13 years old two boys and they're in the water and i was like it's 50 degrees <laughs> it's cold <laughs> and you know the water's got to be at you know about that so we got down to them and i said hey guys isn't the water cold and with the best canuck accents they go oh yeah mister but we just had to go in. We're in South Carolina. I was like, you got to be kidding me. No way. Well, Faye and I were at the beach. Um, let's see. We uh, Sunday, we were sitting there in the soaking up the rays. And a family, a couple of families came down with little kids, you know, under 10. And they were all in the water. And they wow. were, in fact, they were collecting these little three inch wide uh, um, um, jellyfish. I guess they don't sting. And they had like a pailfuls of them. Um, 
but um, they were all in the water swimming and like it was nothing. Yeah. We used to be that dumb too. <laughs> <laughs> now we want heated pools and yeah. yeah. Or so I was never because... that dumb. I never liked cold water. Yes. No, that's because our frontal lobe wasn't as developed back then. <laughs> that's too tough. It, um, I don't know. It, it was chilly. But um, but it was great sitting in the sun, soaking up the rays. It was it was like heaven on earth, you know, like early June. Yeah. Usually their temperatures are like five to seven degrees warmer than here, but I guess during the time we were gone, it was twenty to thirty degrees warmer. Um, it was tough. We spent an extra day. It was really tough to leave. On the Thursday, the Thursday we left, it was 55 in the morning when we left. And we got up here, uh, I think around 8.30 last night. It was, I think, the same temperature. But um, the further north we got, and I was wearing shorts yesterday, and everybody's looking at me saying, why are you wearing shorts? And it's like, it was warm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's, that's how it was. About uh, 10 years ago, we went down to Georgia and uh, stopped at North Carolina on the way back. And I was in shorts, same thing. It was like February, but it was hot, super hot. Yep. The coats on and stuff down there, and I'm in shorts. <laughs> as soon as I opened my mouth, they said, you're not from around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to go down to Myrtle. Uh, we, used to, we used to try to get down there... <clears throat> in late November, early December, and then we'd go in January and February when we had the condo. And uh, we used to golf. I mean, you, know, you could count on it being well into the 50s all those, you know, every month, every one of those three months. And, uh, you know, some days you might get up at well into the 70s. It was, it was that's beautiful. A, that's attractive that. in January. We went to a bar mitzvah in, I think it was January or February about 10 years ago, maybe 13 years ago. And it was minus nine up here. And when we got into Atlanta, it was 30. But we brought shorts anyways. Of course, they were frozen out of their skulls down there. <laughs> Temperature went up to 55. We were in shorts and t-shirts. We went to the um, the Atlanta Zoo, Atlanta Aquarium. And everybody's bundled up in, in down jackets. Yeah. And they're looking at us and saying, are you guys from Alaska or Canada or something? <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome. <laughs> it really was. It was so uh, funny. <laughs> it was it was like major heat wave. We went to this place in the uh, British Virgin Islands for many years. And one year we were down there in January and it was 75 degrees. So we were in shorts and t-shirts and the staff was all bundled up in their warmest and, and hoodies <laughs> The warmest clothing. <laughs> they was they were freezing to death at mm -hmm. seventy five degrees. So we thought, you know, we thought this is heaven, you know, compared to where it was up here in January. Oh, most certainly. Yeah. It's any anything above sixty, I think, is warm enough for shorts. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you must have a comment on that. Well, he... <laughs> anything above minus twenty is warm enough for shorts. <laughs> <laughs> on a motorcycle ay, ay, ay. do you ever wear uh, long pants Charlie um, if I'm going to sit outside for a couple of hours in the winter I'll yeah. put on long pants if I'm stationary but walking around no I've got I short used to time. be like that when I was a big guy yeah uh, well that's so how cold, uh, uh, so if you go up to Maine, are you wearing shorts in the winter too? Oh, or yeah. you never go to Maine? <laughs> down, down to 20 below zero. Yeah. Those maniacs. Yeah. Where are you originally from, Charlie? Are you from up north or? No, from here. Yeah, but I've got uh, Scott Irish uh, background, so there must be some of the craziness. I used to wear a black utility kilt driving tractor trailer and show up in an 18-inch snowstorm in a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must have turned a few heads. Ay, ay, ay. 
Uh, Charlie, my my best friend in the financial world is from uh, Edinburgh, and uh, uh, he, we would show up, you know, to these events for uh, financial people, and you know, if it was like semi formal or something, he'd he'd have his kilt on, and uh, you know, people would say, "Well, what's worn under that kilt?" It's a, it's all in good work and order. Nothing's worn. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, it, it can be fun. <laughs> oh my goodness! I would assume Especially it's... on a motorcycle and a kill. <laughs> it's not the front you have to worry about. You got to tuck that back, back in, or else it's <laughs> freeze to the seat. Well, you know they say a motorcycle puts a smile on your face, so I can not, now I know why. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey oh. Carly. Yeah. Does uh, did anybody ever ask you uh, if you had a graph? Do you feel a graph? Oh yeah, uh, I get all sorts <laughs> of questions. And uh, man, one of the guys, one of the dispatchers, one night I got back after a trucking run, and uh, he goes, "Next thing you know, you're going to be wearing a thong under that thing." I was looking and said, "How do you know I'm wearing one now?" That's imagery I could do with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's too funny. That's, that's the kind of vision you get in your head and then nobody else can uh, you know, you can't get rid of it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> never try to never try to bust a guy who's got the balls to wear a kilt to a truck stop. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about uh, kilts in Edinburgh, uh, we my wife and I were there back in twenty fourteen and uh, in August, and they have this, uh, what they call the Fringe Festival. And Fringe is an apt title for the festival because everything is on the extreme edge. They even had a juggler on the Royal Mile who, uh, among other things, climbed a 10-foot ladder that was unsupported and balanced it. And he, meanwhile, he's wearing a kilt and a top. And, and then he starts juggling these sabers these knives at the top of this 10 foot ladder that's just got the two legs and that's it and he's balanced up there <laughs> and you thought that was the show until he started to do a strip tease <laughs> oh, oh. on top of the ladder juggling these knives and he's got this kilt on so everybody of course <laughs> is wondering you know what's the question hey, well, fortunately, he did get down and he had boxers on. So, yeah. but he managed to strip everything else off on the top of this ladder, juggling these knives, didn't drop any of the knives, didn't hurt anybody, didn't hurt himself. And he got uh -huh. that kilt off and he had a pair of boxers on. Him. Wow. <laughs> and the ladder was unsupported. Unsupported. Just completely just like him. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. But if you ever go to Edinburgh, go in August and go to the uh, Royal Military Tattoo at Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. yes. That is spectacular. quite a festival. The, the, pardon me? It's it, the whole it's a whole week, a whole festival. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's the first three weeks of August. Uh, wow. it's, and it goes on and on and all sorts of things. We were there for a week and, you know, they're giving out free tickets to these shows. Some of them you want you might want to go to others you might not want to go to i mean <laughs> fringe is like i said the apt uh title for this festival so yeah. but uh, but incorporated it's all surrounding the uh three weeks of the uh military tattoo which is done um at edinburgh castle there were 1500 performers uh in the show the year we were there so Whoa. really quite something unreal Yes, got to know how to have fun. That's for sure. They do. They do. You never want to get into a drinking uh, contest with any of them. No, no, no. No, right down the street, uh, uh, less than a quarter, less than a block from Edinburgh Castle is something called the Scotch Whiskey Experience, <laughs> which you also have to, you know, you have to, you have to do it. Oh yeah. To. Yeah. Yep. Just a wee drama, Scotch eye. Right? Yeah, right. Just a wee dram. Right. <laughs> just a wee, just a wee dram. <laughs> of about 50 different scotches. <laughs> I've never met a whiskey I didn't enjoy. That's right. 
No. Not for me. <laughs> uh, it's good for you. Uh, Think of it that, that way. My mom Medicinal. went. We were at a picnic with my son and his girlfriend, and his friends came and they were handing out little little bottle little uh, nips of um, I think it was cinnamon whiskey. Yeah. Oh, was, Fireball. I I don't drink the stuff they offered to me. I said no, thank you. Well, I just want to it, remain standing. <laughs> Larry, it's pretty popular. We have a, a a ball field where all the soccer moms and every you know park their cars, and I walk my dog by there, and like, you know, every day there's about fifteen of those nips in the parking lot. So somebody's having fun while they're watching. Oh yeah, their we kids. find them all up and down the street here. People throw oh. them out the car windows. I mean, it's mm. ridiculous. Oh, I didn't realize they were that popular. But uh, well, it's it's an expensive way to drink, I guess. Mm. Well, I'm with you, Larry. I would have <laughs> passed it up too. I like whiskey flavored whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't drink much of anything. <laughs> a little a beer now and then, and that's it. It's but, not really that expensive a way to drink those great fireball yeah, well, it, because they're a buck a piece, and I can get gonna, totally wasted on about five of them. And started about uh, fifteen minutes. <laughs> I don't know. My son likes the the whiskey. My father used to like whiskey. I don't touch the stuff. Uh, not my thing. If I drink it, it's going to be really cold, like freezer cold. I don't know. But Good anyway. German beer, right, Jurgen? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, a, a, a pina colada on the beach sounds good too. <laughs> Hey there, Ted. Looks like you got a nice background there. Nice sunset. Oh, you're muted there. Got to unmute yourself, dude. Sorry, Larry. Yeah, you on the beach somewhere in Rhode Island? No, I don't. Well, that's a nice background, though. I will ask you, though, Larry. Yes. To ask if there's any volunteers to help me make my sound work on my CW program. All right, well, uh, I'll throw something out there. You can well, ask the group now before we get started. Guys, I have uh, CW Get that Bob Jeffway recommended I get, and I've got FL Digi. I'm looking to try to be able to visually see CW on receive, and for some reason, my Lenovo ThinkPad is not hearing the audio from my 7300 ICOM radio. I think it's a driver problem, or maybe I got to download something to make the 7300 audio come through the computer. But have I just want it to be able to get a visual CW. Have you gone to the ICOM website to download their codec for their, uh, yeah. their radio? Yeah. Okay. And you're sure you've got that one activated? Because I had that exact problem with the 991. No, or, I'm not sure, Marcel, but I'm not very computer literate. Oh, all right. So I get lost when I look at the settings in the FL Digi program as well as trying to navigate the computer. All right. Well, text me after the meeting and we'll set up a time for me to come by. I'll get you working. It's Larry. Larry's going to do it. It's pretty, it's what I do. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> know, easy. If you know what to do, it's pretty easy. But, uh, okay. Uh, anyways, uh, we're going to give it another another five minutes. We'll let everybody in. Hey there, Bob. Do you want to make a uh, SEC meet, uh, announcement or something later? Or sure. Tonight? Tell me. Tell me when. All right. All right. Uh, I'll just put you on the list and I'll call you up. And, uh, and Ted, I can help your stuff. I just sent three documents about the same exact problem to K1II earlier today, getting him going on FT8 with. Um, you know, with the same type of thing with a, with a 7300. So, Bob, that would be nice. Saturday, the same thing. So, I'll send you the simple docs. Yeah, if I don't Larry have to help you through stuff too. Yeah, if I don't have to make Larry do something on his day off with computers, Faye will be happy. <laughs> well, you won't see me much of tomorrow anyway, but you can read these. They're pretty good. You know, the, the ICOM, the ICOM itself um, has a technical four or five pager, which is pretty good. And there's two others on there which I've got from it. And they step you through it pretty nicely. There's a lot of settings in the 7300 that have to be that set just properly. And uh, otherwise you get audio coming in from your mic when you're trying to do the, the, the digital stuff and all that. 
but yeah, we can do it. And if you need it, I can hook into FL, hook into Zoom like this with you. Oh, that would be and great, Bob. Over your computer and show you step by step, you know, what the configuration is. But you still have to push the buttons on your 7300. We can't do that remotely. Yeah, you can take over. <laughs> you can take over my computer anytime, Bob. Okay, thanks. Well, if so you the use the uh, the uh, IC seventy three hundred remote program, you could probably press the buttons. Although I don't know if they offer that like Kenwood does. Yeah. Uh, right. But, uh, <laughs> Bob, Bob, I can't make it tomorrow. I've got another client. Okay, that's fine. I'll do it any other time. I'm sorry. Not a problem. All right, we still got a few more people entering the meetings here. Larry, did I miss it? How was Virginia? Uh, Virginia was great, hot, um, sunny, beautiful. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of, I mean, it's still off season, but um, we we're sort of in the town we were in, I think, was like three streets by four streets big. <laughs> More yeah. horses than people in there. <laughs> and uh, definitely a lot, and boats outnumber everything, although the boats are not in the water yet. But how was Jake? Jake's good. Jake's good. That's uh, good. His girlfriend's moving in with him. He's uh, he's got things in hand. She's got a new job at at a place called the Tides Inn, and um, the average room of the Tides Inn goes from like three hundred to twelve hundred dollars a night. Um, she says people pull up in their uh, their gigantic um, yachts, and um, and you know, stay for the night at the hotel at 900 bucks a night. And it's like, yow. My kind of customer. <laughs> uh, well, you got to find a way to get them to come to Northampton, though, versus uh, sure. down so in, uh, uh, sure. where is it? Uh, Irvington, Virginia. So he's staying in his cottage on the campground? Yep. Yep. Good. Yep. He's got it good. Got it easy. Uh, so it's a good place to be. All righty. We're going to get things rolling in just a minute. And uh, bring my... hey, Larry, did you take your HRV? Uh, no, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long enough drive in, in my, uh, in my ridge lighting. We averaged uh, 29 miles per gallon. Um, and the average speed, I think, at least while I was driving, was probably around 78 which was, and traffic was still screaming by me most of the trip. Uh -oh. The truck is unbelievable. The faster you go, the better the fuel economy is with it. Uh -oh. So it, uh, it was good. We did like 1600 miles over five days. It was a long trip. I'm still tired from the drive yesterday. Uh -oh. I made it to about 60 miles from here and then Faye took over. I had, otherwise I was gonna have to pull over somewhere and take a nap. You weren't pulling your trailer, were you, Larry? Yeah. No, trailer's still in winter in oh, uh, okay. winter storage. We thought about it. It was just too short of a, a, a trip uh, time-wise to tow the trailer. And um, at the time we made the reservations, gas prices were spiking, and it would have cost us a ton of money just for uh, fuel towing the trailer. So if we if we'd gone down for like eight to ten days, I would have taken the trailer. But um, not for originally a five day trip. It was, and we took, we, when we went down a couple of years ago, it was two days down and two days back. Um, Cause you really don't want to go more than 65 towing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, trailer still went tries and probably will be for a few more weeks. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get things rolling here and I'll watch the participants and, um, as they pop in, I'll let more in. I'm surprised there aren't more out uh, already. And uh, welcome, Steve. Is I think that's your first meeting joining us. And you're muted, so uh, uh, we'll ask to unmute you. Welcome to the meeting anyways. I know Steve's a fairly new hand. He's had his license for, what, a year and a half now or so? Maybe two, wait, two years maybe? Yeah, going on two years, but no rig yet. Um, I've got too many other things going. Uh, I figure when I retire, I'll get a rig. Well, lots, lots of opportunity before then. But, uh, <laughs> we'll and lots see. of people to help you, depending on what you're interested in, too. Yeah. Uh, I know. 
All righty, let's get things rolling here. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask everybody to turn off the ringers on their phones, please, um, or mute them, okay? Because we don't want to interrupt the, the guest speaker when that's happening. Um, if you have uh, loud dogs or loud spouses or um, other loud creatures or noises, if you can just uh, uh, shut the door in the room you are in or um, you know, turn off the stereo, the TV, whatnot in the background, be appreciated. Um, <clears throat> like to remind everybody about the uh, 10 meter net on Monday nights at 7 p.m. on uh, 28375. Our own Marcel A1WH is net control and he runs with the W1NY call sign. I tried to check in from Virginia, but we were in the middle of a thunderstorm, so that didn't work out very well. Um, and also, that's 10, meet, uh, 10 meter net Monday nights at 7 p.m. We always have a lot of fun. Uh, I think I saw Aaron check in. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything to announce for the Franklin County? Uh, a little bit. Um, so we're what wrong? We are having Ed Fong, who makes a very nice roll of J pole. Uh, he's been written up of a lot of times. Uh, we are having him as a speaker on Monday, and of course, all HCRA members or anybody is welcome to attend. Um, the link will be up on our website. Today, I still have to write the newsletter tonight, but it will go out just as soon as I possibly can get it out. And uh, it should be an interesting talk. And he's going to have, he has some really nice uh, antennas that he's made. And I, I, apparently he's going to be offering some discount for the presentation. Cool, cool. And what time is the meeting? Uh, seven o'clock. Excellent. Okay. And can you announce your website, please? Uh, it's uh, fcarc.org. Sounds good. Thank you much. Good. Um, Bob, K1YO, you want to go with your announcement? Yeah, thanks, Larry. And just so a lot of you guys probably know already, we do have a Western Mass Aries major exercise going on starting at 10 o'clock tomorrow, lasting till 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, we have a lot of agencies and uh, EOCs involved, probably 35 participants uh, that have registered and anybody is welcome to come in. If you want to poke in and do stuff on HF, VHF, VHF Simplex, you're welcome to take a look at our website. That's wma.arrl.org. And right at the top of that website for the next day or two, you'll see the whole description of what's going on um, for that um, that particular exercise. No, you can't see that, but it's a couple pages long. It's got some points where you can download a form to do logging. Those submitting a log to me will be entered in a raffle contest for a couple of neat prizes, uh, courtesy um, 81 LRL, the section manager. Uh, but we're really trying to test things out for emergency management here, emergency communications. We want to have fun. We expect to have uh, a lot of mistakes, and I have a couple of things rigged, so there's going to be a mistake or two here and there, uh, but we're going to learn from this and have some after event reviews and we'll be going on from then and having regular exercises. So again, join us tomorrow. You're all welcome. 10 a.m. starts with an HF net and uh, take a look at the schedule because we'll have uh, local VHF nets on 940 and all the other repeaters in the five counties that folks are using. Okay. Any oh, good. Anybody have any questions for Bob? Okay. Thanks very okay. much, Bob. Thanks, Thanks sir. Um, let's see here. The, uh, the fantastic zero beat that we've had the last two months is our new zero beat editor, uh, Ken, KD1KU. Um, do you have any comments, Ken, or are you looking for anything for the June zero beat or any zero beat? Uh, basically, if anybody has anything they want to, uh, you know, enter in, whether it's an article, uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, editing or anything, just provide any uh, photographs and, a, and the basic text. We'll do the formatting so you don't even have to worry about that. Just get it to me by the uh, 20th of each month. That's about, uh, it's uh, kd1ku at arrl.net. Well, and, and that the new, the newsletter the last two months has been phenomenal. It's been fantastic. Ken's doing a, a, an amazing job with it. And um, um, the more information that he has, obviously, the better the newsletter is uh, content-wise. So thanks for doing what you're doing, Ken. Uh, Chloe, appreciate you stepping up and 
taking the newsletter and uh, hopefully continuing it in the uh, the excellent fashion you're you're creating with. Um, the HGRA is doing field day this year. We have confirmation from School Street Park in Agawam. Uh, we will be there from around 1 p.m. on Friday afternoon through teardown on Sunday afternoon. Um, we'll be putting up one, maybe two towers. Now that um, the COVID vaccines are um, uh, greatly accelerated from where they were even a month ago, uh, I mean, a month ago, I didn't think I was going to be vaccinated till the end of May, and now I've already had both shots, which is great. Uh, and so many other people I know have too. Um, so we're going to do, um, um, we'd prefer that uh, if you're attending field day in any fashion that you have been vaccinated, masks will be optional. So it's if you want to wear them, you can. If you don't want to wear them, that's up to you. Um, we're still going to be trying to keep everything clean. We'll have uh, Clorox wipes for the gear and for everything else, but we will need um, we'll need somebody to uh, pick up the trailer on Friday afternoon and return the trailer to its place in um, in Southwick at Dave Kane's A One YWs Sunday afternoon. We're going to need help assembling antennas and towers Friday afternoon and tearing it down Sunday afternoon. We're going to need operators from 2 p.m. Sunday to, or excuse me, 2 p.m. Saturday to 2 p.m. Sunday, and um, and everything in between. We um, uh, we haven't started. We're just starting to really ramp that up. Um, I'm going to be sending out emails where you can sign up for different things. Um, you can do as little or as much as you want. Uh, all the help is appreciated. It's always fun. Uh, it should be really interesting. And what are the uh, we'll, dates, Larry? Uh, June 25th to 27th, Steve. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're also going to be hiding one, if not two, of the HRA Fox boxes. Um, right before I left, we got H. We got um, Fox Box Two up and running. Um, so that'll be hidden at the the uh, field day site also. So there'll be a fox, uh, uh, one or two fox hunts on the field day site. And um, um, depending on how many people we have, we'll do some other stuff too. It's, it's always a lot of fun. We're gonna be running off generator like always. Um, I figure we'll do two phone stations and or if we have enough CW ops, maybe can do some CW operation on one or both of the phone stations uh, as we go. Um, so that's where we are right now, June 25th to 27th, 1 p.m. Friday through, we're usually done by three o'clock or four o'clock Friday, uh, Sunday afternoon, the 27th. Um, hope you'll join us. Preferably, we want you vaccinated before you come and um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Also, one thing we did, we scheduled last year and COVID completely destroyed was, um, cleaning out the trailer and taking inventory of everything we have. Um, we've, uh, I was talking to Chris, we're gonna do that on Saturday, May 22nd at 10 a.m. So if you can write that down, uh, 10 a.m. at May 22nd at um, AA1YW's house in Southwick, I will post and email out the, um, the address. Um, five or six people, um, we'll get through it in about two hours or, uh, or so. Is that about right, Bob? It was about two hours the last time we did that? Okay, that's what I figured. So it's uh, taking everything out of the trailer, going through, checking coax, checking everything we need, and then repacking the trailer so it's organized. Um, it's at Dave Kane's house. Rain date will be, I believe, the next day. Um, and we'll see, but we're hoping May 22nd will work out. Uh, if not, we may have to bump it up a little bit. But um, so that's that's trailer day. And if you can give us a good two hours, we can get through everything. If we can get five or six people, you know, we can get through everything, clear it all out, and make sure everything's good. So that's on uh, on May 22nd. Um, and I mentioned uh, somebody to tow the trailer. If you've got a vehicle that can tow an SUV or a small truck that can tow 5,000 pounds or more and has a two inch trailer hitch, then you can tow the trailer. I towed it very easily with my little truck. You might be able to tow it if you have a 3,500 pound limit, but that might really push the weight. 
um, but you just have to go from Southwick to um, feeding uh, to um, Aguam near the um, South End Bridge near the Connecticut River. So if you've got a small SUV um, or truck or more, you can easily tow uh, uh, tow the uh, the club trailer. Uh, let's see here. Um, so now we go to uh, Mariusz, and um, I've known Mariusz now for what, 15 years or so, maybe, maybe more. more. I don't know. Time, more. time goes by. More, because uh, I remember showing up to the HCRA meetings in Aguam with uh, uh, Peter. More Peter, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so maybe it's been more like 20 some odd years. Yeah. Um, I've seen him in good days. I've seen him wrapped up in plastic hardware after motorcycle accidents and uh, and kayaking on the Connecticut River and doing ham radio things. Um, so we've known him for a while. And um, he did, um, um, he's got some really cool stuff to tell us about, uh, about his teachings and um, talking to the International Space Station. So Marius, the, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so when I was thinking, so when I was asked to do this presentation, I was kind of thinking like, how to do this. So what, so what I want to do is, as I'm, as I'm speaking, I want to have um, a slideshow going in the background because between the pictures and the story, it's, it's going to, there's a lot of information. And um, so I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, Larry, can you uh, make me? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, try it now. All righty. Can everybody see that? Yes. All righty. Let me. Uh... All righty. All right. So, <clears throat> talking to the space station. This endeavor was really a, a journey that was quite an interesting ride. And when I say by a quite interesting ride was my mentor, um, Gary Thomas, always told me it's, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And this whole journey started with trying to start an amateur radio club at the, at the school. I didn't know how to start a club. I didn't know what to do. I went to ARL looking for some resources. They told me that, well, we have a teacher's institute that has a program that's gonna, you know, they send you out for a week and they provide you, you know, room and board. And then you have classroom time and you do all kinds of different activities they can bring back with you to the school. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. I applied for it. Last minute, I was able to get in, and they introduced fox hunting. That was something which I really, really like. And they also introduced um, talking to the satellites. And I'm like, you know what? The satellite thing is really, really cool. It's it's something quick. It's I think it's something that the kids would get into after school because <clears throat> they can go outside, they can hold an antenna, they can track it. They all have smartphones, um, and and these kids are kind of interested about like learning new stuff and and not, not many people knew about satellites so i come back to school um after that's you know after that summer of teachers institute i go back to the school and then i start putzing around in my free time during my prep period outside with an antenna and i'm holding this antenna and they're like mr z what are you doing i'm like i'm looking for satellites and they're like satellites it says blue sky what are you talking about so so shelly k1 tdl who's also a ham radio operator that i work with um you know started like helping me out and we downloaded the program heavens above and we're like well we got this satellite it's going over the curvature of the earth and you know we gotta kind of like target it you know we gotta you know track it get the right elevation get the right arc and uh and we started slowly getting into like hearing people talking on the repeater um, through the uh, satellite. So 
you know, that started to get a little bit more interest. And then I'm like, there's gotta be a better way than holding an antenna because holding an antenna, especially an arrow, like for 10 minutes, it, it kind of gets, you know, tiring. So I went to the machine shop and I'm like, I got an idea for a bracket to do this um, amateur radio thing. And they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it for you. And then the kids started working on it and they're like asking the teachers, like, what's this all about? So then I go down to the machine shop and I'm like, well, this is kind of what I do with it. And I demonstrated to them, like, this is how we track satellites. And there's actually people talking and they explain the whole grid square uh, situation with them. And then this really started to get a lot of attention. Um, so we decided to, you know, make a really good, um, antenna tracking system like a manual one and we got some really good success with that and we were practicing and we were we start to get a um, lock into the satellites a lot better uh we were starting to talk to the satellites even and um getting in our grid square and, and hearing ourselves on the downlink so then the uh idea came of well why not talk to the international space station i mean isn't that a cool satellite to talk to and then it's like you know, a 10, 12 minute conversation with an astronaut as opposed to just throwing out your grid square there and your call sign. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I talked to the electronics teacher and a couple of people that were interested with this and we filled out the application process and the application process was quite intimidating. Uh, it had multiple pages. They had word counts for the answers and it, it, it was pretty intense. We applied. Um, we didn't get in. Um, so I was like, okay, well, we'll try next year. We, we tweaked it. And they came back to us and said, yeah, we're, we'll accept you uh, to do a, a space contact. And I was like, okay, this is awesome. And then I start looking into the requirements and I didn't realize that it required some heavy duty equipment. I couldn't do it with our little uh, tripod that um, is going on in the slideshow. And they have requirements, two radio stations, a beam, a backup egg beater, a preamp, an amplifier. And I'm going to myself, wow, how am I gonna do this? Cause the club at the school is something that it's not funded by the school. It's just like, okay, I went to administration. I said, I want to do an amateur radio club. They're like, sure, we'll approve it at the school committee. There you go. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, well, we got the, the clearance to talk to the space station. You know, how do I go about doing it? And one of the requirements that they wanted was to also work with a, a local amateur radio club. So I reached out to to some clubs and um, I got some support from those clubs, uh, MTARA um, and the CCDX out of Keene, New Hampshire. And, and they, they provided a lot of help. Um, and, and how did that look like? So it all started when I went to the superintendent. I'm like, well, I need $500 for an antenna. And he's like, yeah, no problem. Then I realized that that didn't really buy me much. And so I started reaching out to, to all these people. And one of the things that came up in a conversation was you can either do it through amateur radio or telebridge. And we decided, well, we don't want to do telebridge because that's, you know, that's kind of easy. We, we want to have something challenging. I want to have a buy-in from the school. So, so we decided to do it through amateur radio um via the tracking system so as a result of that a lot of people came in they 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 helped us out um gary was a big help he he provided us with direction he provided us with the pointers of what we need to do amongst he also provided us with the antenna tracking system or the interface that helps um control the rotor with, between the program to track a satellite. Except when Gary said that he can help me out with that, he didn't tell me it was disassembled, not soldered, parts and pieces. 
So we went to the electrical electronics department and we're like, so we have this piece here and um, here's the wiring diagram. And, you know, we can't do this after school because we'll never get this done on time. So the electronics teacher was all about this. He got his kids excited about this from, you know, our previous trials. And he actually had a student um, who was autistic, but he was such a good solder. Like he, he did a bang up job on this. S joints were perfect, soldered everything right the first time, like really, really amazing. Then came the issue of, okay, well, how are we gonna mount this antenna? Like, you know, because ultimately the goal was to have our own radio station. So I went to the electrical department. I go to the electrical teacher. Hey, can you run the coax from the roof all the way down into the shop? And can you put it in conduit? So he got his shop involved in that. Then we needed to make an antenna bracket. So we went to CAD. We asked the students in the CAD shop to say, can you make a design a uh, an antenna um, bracketing system that's going to work around the chimney so that way we can go to machine shop. So CAD made the blueprint, got the blueprint, then we went to machine shop. We're like, hey, can you make this bracket for us? No problem. Then we're like, well, we can't have those brackets not painted. So then we went to the auto body shop. We're like, hey, you know, we got these uh, brackets that, that need to be painted. Can you, can you, can you paint them? And it's like, yeah, no, no, no problem. We can, we can paint it. So they, they painted it for us. Um, then we went to the programming and web because part of the uh, Aries contact is you need to advertise this. So programming and web started building a website for us. So the kids in programming web started building a website. Then it's like, okay, well, somebody needs to document all this. So we went to the business tech shop. They started taking pictures for everything that was going on. So the pictures that you're seeing in the in the PowerPoint slide, those are all pictures taken by students from the business tech program and they edited all those pictures. Then came the process of, well, what questions are we going to ask the, the astronaut? So then business tech stepped up and said, okay, well, we're going to generate a questionnaire through Google Docs and forms and we're going to weed out the similar questions and you know determine the questions that we need to answer um then uh, during the event we had um hospitality um serve our guests we had the culinary shop uh make baked goods for us and while all this stuff was going on in the background the math and the sciences decided to to take this event and talk about that in their classroom. So at the end of the day, what it turned out to be was a, a student driven project across all aspects of the school. And it didn't matter whether you were into ham radio or not, you got the exposure of what ham radio is all about. You were able to participate in the event, whether you had a license or not. And it wasn't like a, a setup where, you know, a club came in, set everything up, the kids asked the questions, and then everything got dismantled and went away. This, this, this was something where it was a vested interest. Um, it was supported by administration. It was supported by all the shops. It was supported on the academic side of the house to have a really, really successful event. And as we went through that, there was always like these little, you know, unknowns like, okay, we got one, you know, one component out of the way. We needed some other components. Where are we going to get the funds for that? And, and we were very fortunate that, that a lot of, a lot of people were able to help us out, whether it was through buying some of the components that we needed, whether it was donating some money so we can buy the components that we needed or, or buy the parts where we had components donated, but we're missing the little sun drying materials. So we were able to use that money to buy the sun drying materials. Um, also in the process, we had some students become amateur licensed in amateur radio. 
we put on a VE session at the school that was open to the public. Uh, yeah, we we did a lot of slow scan prior to that. Um, kids got really interested in that. And, um, and then during the event, which kind of led up to, you know, which led up to that 12 minutes, there was a lot of uncertainty. There was a, um, a, a storm in the next town over. The maintenance director um, called me up saying, we might have to shut this down. And I told him, hell no, you're not gonna be shutting this down. This is our, our one shop. Um, and then we went through the event and come to find out halfway through our event, our, our preamp blew. So we were talking on the main station and receiving on our backup station. So that was a little, you know, crazy because that happened really quick and um, uh, Shelly picked up on that. And, and something that started like really small, really turned into a big event. A lot of the, um, the uh, anticipated participants was, was really, really low. But then once school committee members found out what we were doing, they wanted to come. Then the kids' parents wanted to come. And a lot of these kids' parents um, in their family, they had ham radio operators that they didn't know about. So there was like a lot of connections that were reestablished. We had Senator Ann, um, Representative Ann, Ann Gobi, Todd Samoa come and give us a citation. And it's really amazing to see like, you know, how many people were interested in what we were doing. And it was really unique to see how everybody, whether you were a ham radio operator, not a ham radio operator, came together to make this, this event a, a successful event and a very memorable event for everybody, not, for, not only for the students, but for the staff, for the people attending, and for the uh, representatives in our government. It was, it was really, really a wonderful thing and a very, very unique thing. Um, and it just really shows when, when people are, when people come together and, and work together, um, you can really accomplish a, a big, big feat. And, and uh, I, um, Larry has a video that we can show um, that can, can highlight the, um, the event. Okay, you want me to start that right now? Yeah. All right, let me bring that up. Let me stop my share screen here. Uh, let me see. How do I do this? Uh, let's see if we can do this on my two screen or... All right, give me one sec. I've never done this myself. Come on. And in the meantime, um, we actually had uh, one thing I forgot to mention is we had a local uh, engineering uh, company, which was a, a couple, and uh, we were having some problems with the aero antenna with the S height SWR and the two meter side, and they uh, they actually helped redesign the aero antenna so that way we could get a, a really low SWR. Um, and that was a fun experience to, to go through that process of going to an actual radio lab, seeing the modeling and having machine shop build the parts. So that way when we go back there, we can build it all together too. Okay, is, can anybody see, I've never shared my screen so, um, can anybody or everybody see the, uh, the, the video? Okay, let's let it rip. No, you gotta share the sound. What's that? Oh, you gotta share the sound. Oh, 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 oh. Screen sharing. Uh, On the bottom it says share sound. Uh, except it doesn't. Uh, just bear with me. Um, um, if you move your mouse all the way to the bottom of the screen, does it show up? No, it does not. Let me... 
And there's nothing that says share sound. Uh -oh. So when you click on share screen and it has a box of all the different screen options. All right, wait a minute. Maybe I gotta. Ch uh, I have to probably change the the audio from my microphone to the maybe to the speaker. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, let's see here. Let's try that. Enable. All right. Um... Is the volume up on the bottom, Larry? Right next to where you are. Come on. Oh no. No, it's not doing anything. Sorry guys. Um Gary, you want to try it from your computer? Hmm. Let's see what I got here. Uh, do, do. We just got to find where it is because I didn't have it. Didn't have it handy. Oh, uh, sorry. It's all right. I uh, will find it. And. Uh, I'll search for it here. Mm, okay, well, here's a PowerPoint for it that we did. Um, so I know when in, in the basic settings in the background, uh, when, you, when you go into settings, there should be a place for, and maybe that'll be easier for me to to find it uh, here, but uh, I know we have, I've got it on this PC someplace now. It's probably in an obvious place. Okay, uh, this might be it. Uh, no, that's a PowerPoint, son of a gun. Well, let me see if I can't. Because uh, we all have it and just pardon us here for a second. Uh, I don't say anything there, there was, there's a setting somewhere in there about sharing computer audio in, in the, in the zoom setup. And uh, I'm seeing if, but I can't get into my uh, settings cause uh, let's see. Um, why don't you try, um, Let's see. Students in a Western Massachusetts high Ooh. school. Here you go. Well, made history today communicating with a human and. All right, we got audio. Now we need the video to the video. Students in a Western. Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. In the meantime, I'll look for it too. <laughs> Where is it? All right, do you guys see that? There yeah. Yeah. All right. Western Massachusetts High School made history today, communicating with a human in outer space. 2010 News reporter Cy Backer was in Palmer today when they spoke with an astronaut in orbit, 250 miles above the Earth. For 10 minutes Friday morning, students at Pathfinder Regional Vocational and Technical High School in Palmer were in contact with U.S. astronaut Serena Onan Chancellor aboard the International Space Station, orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. 
Pathfinder students asked technical questions, and the astronaut provided them with the answers. We actively circulate ammonia through those radiators, and that is how we dissipate heat. Over. The students used amateur radio equipment to make contact with the astronaut. Their successful communication was an accomplishment that put those students in high spirits. <laughs> it's phenomenal because when you think about it, it's just, oh, yeah, we get to talk to an astronaut that's up in space. Like, cool. <laughs> but then it happens and you're like, oh, my gosh, we just talked to an astronaut up in space. It's insane. It's, again, it's insane. The faculty director of the school's radio club told 22 News it took two years to clear the way for Friday's historic communication with a human in outer space. I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm so happy. My heart's throbbing. It's, it's, I didn't get a lot of you know, sleep last night because I was tossing and turning to make sure this was going to be a successful event. It's, it's as good as the Red Sox winning the World Series. Better! <laughs> Better! Vocational school superintendent Dr. Gerald Paste was overjoyed with the students' accomplishments. I've been here for 45 years, and this is the top of the line, the biggest spectacle, I think, educationally that I've seen in a long time. Pathfinder students on Friday join just 12 other American high schools whose students have spoken directly with an astronaut orbiting in outer space. In Palmer, Cy Becker, 22 News. Students that have been working, they've been coming after 
after school. They've been doing all kinds of craziness. Um, and they've been putting up with, with us. Um, some of these are women in STEM people. Some of these are ham radio. Some of these are just kids that worked on the project. Either they worked on a little piece of the project. So through the school, how we got to this point, they worked on, some kids just worked on brackets. Who worked on the brackets? Raise a hand. There you go. Who worked on, um, like, the wiring? Where's, oh, get over here, Dana. Dana wired this station up. She's an, she's an electrical program. Dana, Dana did. Dana doesn't know anything about ham radio. She doesn't want to play. I mean, she kind of got interested in it, but she's not interested in ham radio. It's just like what happened with our space program. So Val's going to run a little video about how we got to this point, how the United States got to where we are today. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. On the, on the left over here, not just for ride on the Soyuz, but this international space station.
learning, that's the third stage engine learning. Final seconds to reach orbit. I remember watching a shuttle launch one day and my father came up to me and said, do you want to work for NASA? I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, that's great. You need to be an engineer. And of course, my dad was an engineer. I followed my dad's advice that he gave to me at an early age about being an engineer and went to the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then about midway through my engineering curriculum, I had a lot of friends who were actually pre-med engineers. And they said, Serena, you need to, you need to think about medicine, you'd be a great doctor. And so during college, I actually spent a lot of my time teaching martial arts. I um, learned Kung Fu when I was in high school and in undergrad, I was looking for a little bit of a job and, and looking for a school to train at. And so I, I found a school in the southeast part of DC, not the best part in the world, but um, really good instructors. And I used to take the Metro uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from uh, GW's campus down there. Um, I started training there myself just to have more physical fitness. And then they said, hey, we thought you'd be really good with kids. Would you mind teaching a kids class on Mondays and Wednesdays? After finishing my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, um, I was accepted to University of Texas uh, Health Science Center Houston, their medical school, right in the medical center, and started my medical training there. Um, when I was a fourth year medical student, I knew I wanted to do a rotation at NASA, but when I came down in October of 2000, I learned that there was a special program that combined internal medicine, which is medicine for adults and, and what I love, with aerospace medicine. And that program existed at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. My personal journey, you know, it started off as an engineer, turned into a physician, which I absolutely love. And a lot of people say that the journey along the way is the best part in getting to your end destination. And, and it really has been, because I absolutely love um, being a doctor. Uh, but at the same time, since I was little, I've always wanted to be up there. I've always wanted to be in space. So I worked space operations uh, in Mission Control, or FICR-1, as we call it for Space Station. Spent a lot of time in Star City looking after the astronauts who were training out there. So I got a little bit of a preview as to what their lives were like. So I do work as a Capcom. One of my favorite jobs, actually. I love talking to the crew because I know they're up there, they're working hard, and sometimes just hearing a friendly voice is really nice. So I have been to Antarctica, and that was one of my neatest analogs. I did that from the 2010 to 2011 season. So I spent two months in Antarctica and six weeks um, living on the ice in a tent. We had a mountaineer who was the leader of our team, a very small team of four, um, and we were by ourselves. There are no bugs, there's no ants, there's no animals. Unless you're near the coast, then you have the seals, you know, and you have the penguins. I still have dreams at night where I hear the wind hitting the tent. Um, and when the wind's not blowing, it's just absolutely silent. There's nothing out there but you and the ice and your tent mates. Five things that you probably didn't know about me. Probably number one, our family has two dogs who, who really think they are brothers. And one is a 130 pound French Mastiff named Boss Hog. And the other is a 12 pound miniature Dachshund named Oscar. And they run around together and they think they are absolute brothers and absolutely the same, but they are absolutely the heart and soul of our family. Number two. Uh, our family absolutely loves to watch Aggie baseball. It's one of the favorite things that we do together as much as we can, certainly during baseball season in the spring. And in fact, it was the last thing we did uh, before coming out to Russia to prepare for launch. We watched the Aggies play baseball at the University of Tennessee. Number three, 
uh, I actually do still practice medicine. I'm an active physician, and one of my favorite places to see patients is at a free clinic in Galveston, Texas, uh, where we practice medicine for uh, the underserved and those who can't afford medical care and do not have insurance, and that's at St. Vincent's House in Galveston, Texas. Completely student-run free clinic, but it's one of the joys. Um, I love going there, and I love seeing my patients, and it allows me to teach medical students and residents um, really how to practice medicine in an underserved environment and something I enjoy doing every week when I'm able. Number four, uh, my husband and I had a very non-traditional wedding on a thousand acre ranch and part of our wedding reception we actually had a rodeo event and there was a big calf roping event that occurred and most of our guests say they had never ever been to a wedding or a reception like that but thought it was the best thing they'd ever been to. Final one, number five, something many people do not know about me is that when I was uh, getting my bachelor's degree at the George Washington University, I also needed to work to earn some money. And so I actually taught martial arts. I taught Kung Fu to school age kids from age five to about 15. And I would do that three times a week. And that's how I earned money in college, teaching martial arts. MDS, KB1, MDS to NA1, SS. Right uh, we copy. Uh, this right is KB1, edge. MDS from Pathfinder Regional Vocational Technical High School in Palmer, Mass. Do you copy? Thank you. Here's your first question. Hello, this is Lauren. Our bodies are used to living with the force of gravity. How does living in microgravity affect the human body? Over. your view on the world. Over. How do you dissipate heat into space when heat transfer through a vacuum is poor? Over. And did I think that heat transfer through a vacuum is very poor? The ISS uses massive radiators that extend out from our truck, and we actively circulate ammonia to those radiators, and that is how we dissipate heat. Over. What system and what field do you use? Over. So, Devin, uh, we use, often we use uh, a propulsion system up here as the progress vehicle, which we do have docked right now, and we use that for reboots. This is Nick. If you need to manufacture a part or tool on the ISS, how is this accomplished? Do you have any machines such as 3D printers, mills, or drills to assist you? Over. So we do have a 3D printer, but we have not used it yet to create any tools. Uh, we're kind of still in the age where we fly multiple spare parts. So we, we don't have just one drill or one torque wrench. We have multiple, multiple parts, both on the American side and the Russian side, if we need them. But I agree, 3D printing is probably where we should be headed. Over. Hello, this is Cheryl Ann. After reaching a professional goal of space travel, what piece of advice could you share with high school students who are navigating toward their future? Over. So the advice I give you guys is that the years after high school are going to start to move more quickly every year. You know, it's going to be astonishing at how fast it travels. And you may not be sure what field you want to go into, and it's okay to be unsure, and it's okay to change your mind. I majored in electrical engineering in my undergrad years and went pre-med halfway through. Now, I stuck with the engineering degree, but I never even considered pre-med when I first entered. Um, but, you know, with the help of family and friends, I decided that was the right thing for me. So just don't be afraid to change your mind. Over. Hello, this is Molly. Do you generate enough electricity to power everything on the ISS? And if not, how do you compensate for the lack of power generated? How do you manage excess generated power? Over. 
Is there a uniform set of rules that guide activities and projects on ISS? Over. Yeah, absolutely, Colby. Um, all the nations that are up here, all of our, what we call our international partner countries, we all sign the same agreements um, as to the rules and responsibilities on board the ISS, uh, even during the time of science experiments and things like that. And these are very, very well understood, um, certainly not only by the crew up here, but also by the folks on the ground. Over. Hello, this is Abley. How difficult is it to readjust from living in space somewhat isolated for six months in a microgravity environment to living on Earth? Over. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the biggest things is once you land, because um, I'm still up here, so I haven't experienced that yet, but once you land, you know, the first thing that happens is you feel like you're in space. Um, and so I think How do you prevent or monitor space debris from coming in contact with the ISS? And in the event of a space debris collision, how do you fix the outside of the space station? Over. Yeah, so we think about this all the time. We actually have big agencies down there in the United States that track hundreds of thousands of objects in low Earth orbit 24 hours a day. And we have temperature difference can be over 300 degrees different from the sunny side of the ISS to the shaded side. Why do we not use thermal generators? Over. experience that are difficult or impossible on Earth are best suited to the microgravity on the space station. Over. ISS is facing the sun. The sunlight side is at 120 degrees Celsius and the other side is at one, negative 100 degrees Celsius. How do the, you thermoregulate the inside of the station between the extremes? Considering that there are no thermal convention in the micro, microgravity in, environment. Over. Very cool. Yeah, and, and I want to say one thing. Like some of these kids were fearful of coming up there and speaking because originally when this was going to be happen, we weren't expecting to have so many people. So there was uh, <clears throat> the whole shop was filled with people. Um, so the, the shop was filled with people uh, from uh, rep, like from the government officials to parents to the school committee, and then in the gym everybody in the school was watching this um, in the gym via like, uh, you know, a camera that was in the shop that was being projected into the gym. So the whole school watched this. And, and a lot of these kids, you know, some of these kids, uh, you know, they, they had trouble with reading and all that. And they really rose up to the challenge and, you know, of that pressure of everybody watching you and saying the question clearly. And it, it, there were so many, amazing things about this project that you know it's, it's just really hard to talk about it in such a short period of time but 
like I said, this was a, a wonderful journey to a destination where a lot of nice memories were formed. A lot of friendships were uh, bonded, new friendships were made. And seeing how everybody worked together for a common goal and to put something so big together is amazing. Okay. Sounds good, that's amazing. Um, do we have any questions from anybody? Yeah, Marius, this is Steve. Hi, Steve. Uh, I thought it was a fabulous, fabulous presentation and everything that you did to, uh, uh, to bring it off. I have one question. This was done in 2018, right? Correct. Okay. So have there been any follow-ups with the uh, kids who were involved? I mean, do you know what any of them are doing? Have any of them gone, you know, further into engineering? Um, or... Some of them, one of them, uh, one of the students that was there, uh, Nate Kendall, he actually went into the Marines. He's in the Marines right now. He did get licensed before he left. And um, prior to COVID, he was working on getting his general license. Um, some of the other students are, are still in school. They're, they're moving up in the grade levels. And some of the students are out in the workforce already. In their oh, very nice. Thank you. Yep. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Mariusz? Yeah, I have a question. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, very uh, uh, the uh, pictures you've shown earlier uh, of them uh, building the antennas, is that a big antenna that you had uh, that they were working on? Was that a commercial antenna they were putting together or did they make that one from scratch? Uh, the, the, uh, the real long one? Yes. That was a commercially made antenna. That, okay. that one we got, we purchased a DX engineering, um, helped us out they didn't they helped us out because um when i reached out to a couple different companies i told them what's going on i let them know that i had a very limited budget and i was working on donations and you know whatever came in and they actually gave us a, a, a discount on a lot of the stuff that we were able to buy oh that's very good then uh yeah because everything worked out seemed to work out fine you had the uh rotor set up and uh, I guess the uh, azimuth rotor too. And uh, it looked like everything worked fine. You were tracking everything on the computer. Uh, I'm really happy to see that everything worked out and the kids had a great time. Thank you. Very good, very good. Any other questions from Mariusz? Any final words, Mariusz? Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I look forward to that once, uh, once this, pandemic gets over to get the amateur radio club going again and you know working with the clubs in the area to do some uh new and exciting things together well thank you for for joining us if the uh the hcra the new hcra can be of any assistance to you uh please ask we have lots and lots and lots of resources uh as you know um and we can do anything uh help you in many different ways if you need help um, and we have lots of educators that are uh, educated people that be willing to uh, to assist in any different way. Um, and but thank you very much for coming out tonight or, or joining us tonight. And uh, fascinating meeting. It, it must have been uh, an exhilarating meeting, uh, uh, putting it all together and having it culminate and and talking to the ISS. It must have been uh, uh, indescribable happiness for you. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a very joyful moment. Um, it, it's definitely one of the things I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. And like I said, um, during the contact, our, our preamp blew. So um, now I understand why they say you need a backup radio station. So the kids were talking on the primary radio station. We were receiving on the backup. And I, I'm telling you, it, it, it was very memorable because a lot of little hiccups that people didn't see, but you have to think on the spot and keep on going. Cool. Cool. Well, excellent. Well, thank you again. It, uh, it looks like it was amazing. And, uh, 
you know, hopefully down the road, you'll come up with new projects. And, uh, and again, the HRA is here. If you need any help, you need to just ask again, because we, uh, we're here this time. Um, let's see here. Uh, other things going on with the club. Um, again, uh, we actually finished, finally finished Fox box two. It took us forever. We, um, we thought we had it working and then we found that we couldn't program the, uh, interface and came to find out we had the wrong cable. So we now have the right cable interface and, and, uh, the Fox box, the interface is programmed. I tested it the night before I left for Virginia. And um, hopefully, if all goes well, um, maybe I'll get it hidden tomorrow or Sunday, and um, and then we'll have Ken hide Fox Box One, and we'll have two local Fox Boxes to go looking for. And I know um, down in Connecticut, somebody else, Rod N One Are You, you've just built um, a Fox Box too. So there's uh, um, in Northern Connecticut, they're from Manchester North. There's uh, five different Fox Boxes. Uh, that are being hidden at any different, any given time during the week. So for, between Manchester, Connecticut and um, uh, Northampton, Mass, uh, there could be uh, anywhere from seven Fox boxes out there, uh, enough to keep anybody busy for a, a good weekend or for a good couple of hours. Um, but uh, stay tuned for that. And if you want more information, uh, besides a basic announcement, you want to learn more about fox hunting and um, how to track down the Fox box and how to activate it. If you go to groups.io and join uh, WMA Fox Hunters, um, you'll learn how to activate the Fox box and, um, uh, and stuff. So uh, that, that's coming up there and that'll be activated hopefully this weekend. Uh, next month we have um, HCRA elections. And as far as I know, um, my, the current board on the HCRA is staying on for another year. Uh, no one else has volunteered to be on the board. So, uh, we'll be, we'll be doing elections there and we'll be updating everybody with field day. Uh, keep in mind Saturday, May 22nd for, uh, cleaning out the trailer and doing inventory. Um, I know Gary AA1UE is working on fall speakers for, um, September through, June for next year. We've got some great ideas and um, hopefully we'll have them in place and uh, they'll be announced pretty soon. Um, does anybody else have any announcements or comments they'd like to make tonight? Quiet night tonight, short, small crew. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you especially to Mariusz for uh, the presentation, it was amazing. It was very cool, very way, way up there on a very cool scale. And uh, thank you, the, the kind of science that uh, that I love learning about. Um, like to uh, thank everybody for joining us, and um, the meeting is adjourned. Everybody have a great, safe weekend. Happy Mother's Day to uh, to the moms, and um, hopefully we'll hear you on the air. Have a good night. No, don't, catch any, don't catch any falling rockets. <laughs> <laughs> falling rockets. <laughs> falling rockets. <laughs> Maybe we can track it. <laughs> Maybe we can talk to it before it burns up. Well, I still have one antenna left up there for something to get, so that's a good chance. Hi, <laughs> right, Jay. Good night. Good night, Larry. Good night, Ted. Good night, Al. Good night. Good night, Ed. Jay and Gary. <laughs> Good night, John boy. <laughs> 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 Seven three, everybody. Good night, Ken. Your sunset, Ted, looks like the way it did in uh, down in uh, Virginia the past couple of days. It was hot and and beautiful sunsets. Uh, or what little we could see of the sunset, I should see from the river. It's not like watching the sunset from the Cape. Yeah. <laughs> all righty. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good night, all. Um, let me just do one more thing.
Hang on one sec, Mary. Let me, uh, Ted, I'm going to ask you to sign off. Okay. Bye, Larry. Good night, Ted. All right. And Al, if we can sign off. Okay. Okay. There we go. Yeah, because when is the club going to start meeting in person? Or If uh, I was talking to the person at um, Hoyoke Hospital uh, a couple months ago, and that was before the, the vaccines became so prevalent. Uh, and he said, as soon as the vaccines are out for everybody, then they will allow um, people in the meeting room. And just from, I would say, just from the number of people that have been vaccinated in the last month, um, we should be able to start meeting in person for our, se for our September meeting. I don't know for, f for June, um, but definitely for September. Um, by September, everybody's confident should be back too, as long as there's not some you know, third major breakout where everybody's getting sick that uh, that was vaccinated. Oh, okay. Because um, cause, cause once, uh, cause I'm hoping that next school year is going to be somewhat normal. I mean, I, I know that we don't know what that's going to look like, but I was kind of hoping to get the amateur radio because I want to pick up where I left. Mm -hmm. I want to do the fox hunting and I definitely need help with, you know, with that, like getting the Fox boxes. I saw them online, um, you know, cause I kind of want to stir up, stir, stir up that interest again. Cause, cause we got a lot of interest after that space contact, but then COVID right. hit, just like, like all that effort just got decimated. And uh, I want to recapture that, those, those kids back again. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I've got, um... Before, well, before COVID started, we were planning on doing a ham class and um, we bought a, bought a box of um, the Baofeng UV5Rs. Um, we used one for a Fox, our Fox Box One and um, there's a little company called Bionics, B-Y-O-N-I-C-S out in California, Arizona. And Bion, B-Y-O-N, is the uh, the main owner of the company. Uh, he makes all sorts of little interface, but he makes two different interfaces, one specifically for the um, the Baofeng and one for other radios. And we've had some problems where our Foxbox One uses the, uh, uh, the, the Baofeng interface, which is specifically for that, the UV5R. And um, our second one uses the uh, PICCON interface, um, which will work with any radio. In fact, I've got ours right behind me on the floor. Um, but anyways, back to, we originally bought a pack of five or six HTs and I still had, and originally we were going to raffle them off and just give them away to some of the uh, um, students that passed the test for, um, uh, for our ham test, which got, postponed and turned into a virtual test and all that changed. But, um, you know, I can, I can offer you pretty much anything, Mariusz. Um, I can't imagine why the previous people that ran the club um, before I got on the, the higher end of the board would, would turn down uh, um, sponsorship of your event, but uh, I can guarantee you that'll change with me in charge. Oh, okay. um, but um, I can offer you, you know, the club will, will uh, uh, do anything in their power to, um, to help you succeed with the class and help you, um, but we can donate, I can donate rigs to you, okay? I've got, uh, you know, if you wanna um, use one of the Baofengs for um, a Fox box, and maybe we can uh, incenti incenticize and use the other leftover ones for, um, um, you know, if some of the kids get their license, we can offer them as as a uh, uh, incentive. Okay. Yeah, because what I like, because I guess what I like
for, for help right now what I could really like like I said once things roll again roll, rolling in again because I got to build up that that excitement again you know and so I would like to get some help with like you know like maybe setting up a 